This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. just give you a, a little brief biography of, of Ralph, who um, is really a product of UCSF. He went to medical school here, did his res residency, chief residency at UCSF, spent a short period of time then at um, the University of Colorado before coming back to UCSF in 2001. He's really played a significant role <clears throat> in research in the U.S. and actually globally to try to ensure that antibiotics are used uh, rationally uh, and effectively. At the beginning of his career, he directed a multidisciplinary task force on behalf of the CDC to develop practice guidelines uh, for use of, uh, for management of acute respiratory tract infections in adults, uh, a condition where antibiotics are commonly used but rarely, uh, rarely needed and rarely helpful. And then to implement these guidelines, he conducted um, a whole number of small and large scale intervention studies to compare the effectiveness of different interventions to reduce the uh, use of and inappropriate use of antibiotics. <clears throat> His research has always been multidisciplinary, patient-centered, and informed by relevant stakeholders and policymakers, including the CDC um, and other professional societies, community clinicians, and patients. More recently, Ralph has taken over the position of Chief Innovation Officer at UCSF, where he runs uh, and directs programs to help support frontline providers in the design and implementation of high-value care strategies. He's also one of the leaders of the Center for Healthcare Value. Ralph. Thanks, Deborah. Pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, my career has taken on a little uh, change in uh, shape with th this new role uh, with clinical innovation in the health system. But as you're going to see, or as you heard, um, antibiotics and appropriate use of antibiotics has been my l lifelong, career long uh, mission in terms of trying to save antibiotics for the next generation. And uh, I think, you know, right now, I'm to tell you, to foreshadow the end of the story, I think it's a mixed review. I think there's some good things that have been happening since we started down this path, but there's still a long ways to go. And what I hope to cover for you today is, uh, you know, what does the landscape look like with regards to antibiotics? And in particular, what are some of the unintended consequences and the harms of antibiotics? Because we all know about the good things that happen with antibiotics. And so that, that is where we fit in with the, the choosing wisely and um, the less is more uh, theme for this session. And so, you know, the issue around antibiotics really took shape and hold in around 1995 when antibiotic resistance among common bacteria in the community first began to get recognized. And if you can think about the introduction of antibiotics since 1944, um, we really had we saw resistance immediately after we started using antibiotics, but it wasn't affecting major pathogens or bacteria, and it was mostly confined to the hospital. And it wasn't until 1995 where we started seeing resistance in Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, this is a bacteria that is the leading cause of bacterial pneumonia, the leading cause of meningitis, the leading cause of ear infections in kids. Now we're talking about millions of people who are now at risk if we can no longer treat these bacterial infections. And so in the red, you can see up from the beginning of antibiotics through the 80s, these red bars rec represent uh, intermediate resistance, which means that even though it was resistant in the laboratory, we could still increase the dose of our antibiotics to cover the infection. But then we started seeing high-level resistance uh, in the mid to late 1990s, and that is really what uh, caused the alarm. Now, since that time, uh, un uh, unfortunately, the problem with uh, unintended or adverse effects of antibiotics and antibiotic-resistant infections has really started to, uh, to increase uh, quite a bit. 
In the 1990s, I was hard pressed to find you know, true patient stories who had suffered the uh, unintended consequences of antibiotic resistant infections. Uh, but over the period of time since that began in 1995, we now have websites like this one from the Infectious Diseases Society of America where people post their stories. And they're really uh, tragic and hard to read, uh, but it's important that we hear what's happening in, with people's lives and experiences. And many of these stories have common themes. These are young, otherwise healthy patients uh, who developed uh, an infection um, from the gymnasium or uh, in a simple cut or wound that wound up in the hospital and then uh, didn't respond to antibiotics and, and had a, either died or had a serious consequence of that. The other stories that we're hearing a lot more of are people using antibiotics for good reason, like a severe tooth infection or um, you know, some other uh, local infection. And then later, after t finishing the antibiotics, they develop diarrhea and fever and what we call Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. And, uh, and even though that's not a resistant infection, it's a consequence of using antibiotics, whether you use them for good reasons or for, uh, for inappropriate reasons. Um, and so we've been tracking this a long time now, for about the last 10 to 15 years, and the CDC has really done a good job now of providing resources to both healthcare professionals as well as the public to know what, uh, what's emerging as the most urgent threats uh, at the present time and what can the public and healthcare community do to help curb uh, the, the problems with antibiotic resistant infections. Uh, if you go to the site today, you'll find that there are three most urgent threats. Our first, Clostridium difficile, which again is an infection of the intestines that occurs uh, usually after a course of antibiotics. Um, a second one is one called carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, so that's a mouthful. Uh, but it's basically uh, an, a gram-negative infection that you get in the hospital primarily. And this is the infection that people get uh, uh, either through person-person uh, contact and, and uh, contamination, but more importantly with instruments that get used in the hospitals like endoscopes and, and uh, colonoscopes or um, um, and I forget blanking on the name of the uh, <laughs> pulmonoscope, uh, bronchoscopes, thank you. Um, so if they're not decontaminated properly, you can spread this infection from one person to patient to the next. And, that was, uh, and that's something that, that is now becoming a much bigger problem because they're resistant to every antibiotic, uh, th these infections. So the number's not as great as C. diff, where we have a million here with 9,000 here, but uh, this is something that we really need to uh, keep a close eye on. And the last one's one we remember that is familiar, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, or you know, uh, the, the active agent that causes gonorrhea, the sexually transmitted disease. And again, because primarily because of the liberal use of antibiotics in many uh, developing countries, uh, the resistance rates continue to rise and make this a difficult uh, uh, bug to treat. And as you all know, from, inter from international travel may being so easy now, these bugs don't really have any boundaries, and it's very easy to, for these. Uh, superbugs to go from one country to the next. Um, now, unfortunately, this list on the serious threats has gotten quite long. Um, so remember, in 1995, it was mostly drug-resistant strep pneumonia, and uh, there's also multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis. Uh, we've sort of kept these at bay, but as you can see, um, the list gets longer and longer. And uh, and for sure, the, the most common uh, risk factor for acquiring one of these bugs is recent or prior antibiotic use. Um, I want to show a little more data on the trends that we're seeing with C. diff and with, uh, and with MRSA, or methicillin-resistant staph, because it really is, it sort of uh, really tells you uh, the urgency that we have uh, for getting a hold of this. So this shows you back to 1993, uh, we had fairly low levels of C. diff infection uh, rates in the hospital, and then it really started taking off in the 2000s. And the problem with C. diff is that it's not just um, a, a bacteria that can be spread from person to person, but there are these spores uh, that the bacteria uh, produces that uh, are dormant and um, are really hard to eradicate in the environment. And so even though you might do really good uh, decontamination of the patient and protective equipment around the patient, the healthcare providers, if you're not careful about the walls and the bed posts and, uh, and getting those spores uh, eradicated, then that's a, a way that this continues in the environment. So we've had a tough time with this, and you can see we're still working hard, um, uh, but 
in 2011, we went up to 500,000 uh, cases per year. So now that point would be about up here just two years later with 29,000 deaths. Uh, so definitely number one at UCSF Hospital, if you look at our two North metrics and our organizational goals and priorities for the hospital, C. diff number one. And, and uh, we have lots of different approaches we're taking to this. Uh, with MRSA, there's a little bit of a better story here. So with MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph, uh, this can be acquired both in the community, we call community-associated MRSA, or you can get it in the hospital. Um, the dotted lines here uh, are the hospital-associated rates of MRSA. And so since we implemented over the last five to 10 years quite a few programs in the hospital to uh, identify MRSA cases early, isolate them early, and uh, to use antibiotics more judiciously and appropriately, we have seen a, a nice uh, trend downwards with hospital-acquired MRSA. The problem is we haven't made much of a dent with the community-acquired MRSA, which is down here, and that is, again, going to take additional efforts to curb uh, community levels of antibiotic use, uh, uh, not just hospital levels. And so what is this relationship between antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance? As I said earlier, that's really the strongest risk factor for, uh, for either uh, acquiring a resistant infection or becoming colonized with resistant bacteria and spreading it. And so it really happens through two mechanisms. The first is really uh, the, the, the mechanism that we talk a lot about with uh, medical students, the traditional mechanism of developing new resistant clones. And so people who take antibiotics uh, repeatedly um, can start to develop uh, mutations in bacteria that then allow them to survive. Uh, and most of this actually doesn't happen in humans. It happens in the animal uh, industry uh, because of the use of antibiotics in uh, agriculture and in animals and in uh, livestock. Uh, it's been about 80% of all the antibiotics that get consumed in this country are occurring in the animal industry. And so this is where we've been developing a lot more uh, strategies to help reduce the use of those uh, antibiotics as growth promoters and, and overuse uh, uh, for infections in animals. This is the mechanism, transmission of existing resistant clones, that I think, as the public, we should all be more aware of. And so the way this works is that uh, you take a course of antibiotics for you know, a, a urinary tract infection. It doesn't matter if it's for a good reason or a bad reason. Again, it just, these are just the trade-offs with using antibiotics. When you take those antibiotics, you kill your body's healthy bacteria. And so the only thing that, uh, that resides in your intestine and in, your, in the areas where you're colonized with bacteria um, are those bacteria that are resistant to antibi the antibiotic you took. Now, many times you don't even, you don't have any bacteria, right? Because most of us aren't colonized with resistant bacteria. But what happens when you go to Muni or you touch something and you, you start getting germs that are in your common environment, if those germs are resistant to antibiotics, then you become colonized with those resistant germs. And then you, uh, but you don't get sick from those germs in the vast majority of, of cases. But then those germs live in you for a few months. You spread those you know, unknowingly as well. And that's how this cycle takes off with antibiotic resistance in the community. So once the clones, once the resistant bacteria get established in a community, it's really the amount of antibiotics that are used in that community that determine how fast the rates rise. And we see this when we look at different countries and their different rates of antibiotic use are directly correlated with the levels of resistance. And I'll show you some data on that. Um, the CDC and now uh, the White House even has gotten in, uh, is now doing um, an annual review of, of our uh, efforts to uh, reduce the impact of antibiotic resistance uh, in this country. And, and it's really a high priority item both in the public health sector as well as the, uh, the federal sector. Uh, and so this is the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria uh, that came out just in March of 2015. Um, and they have basically five goals. Uh, and just to review those briefly for you, just to give you a sense for what is what are we doing here in the US to, to help slow this down. The first is to slow the emergence of resistant bacteria and prevent the spread of resistant infections. And so this is all about reducing uh, our overuse uh, or in unnecessary use of antibiotics, both in the food industry and in humans. Um, the second is to strengthen our national One Health surveillance efforts. And that means that up and through, when we first started this in the 2000, we had 
FDA over here, we had Department of Agriculture over here, and they were, they were mostly dealing with the, the food industry and the agricultural use of antibiotics. We had uh, NIH doing the research, we had CDC doing public health, we had all these agencies, but they weren't really communicating. And so over the years now, we've basically created a national One Health surveillance system where all those organizations are communicating with each other about what bugs are showing up, how are they interrelated uh, in a way that um, doesn't have people working in silos. And that's, they've had some good uh, uh, effects of that. Uh, the third is to develop better uh, and more rapid diagnostic tests. So you've all been to the doctor probably with some type of infection. We don't have a lot of great tests to tell you, A, is it viral, which doesn't need antibiotics, or is it bacterial? And then when people do have serious bacterial infections, we don't know which ones are resistant and which ones aren't. So if you want to find a company that has developed a good way to do this in a rapid uh, test, I'd invest in that company. <laughs> um, uh, but we are, you know, as a federal government, we are also putting a lot of resources and funding into supporting investigators who are doing some of the newer genetic testing to help get us something uh, to market. Uh, the fourth is to accelerate research to develop new drugs, new antibiotics. And the problem with antibiotics is most pharmaceuticals companies don't want to invest in antibiotic development because it takes 10 to 15 years to develop them. And then as soon as resistance develops, they, they don't have a market anymore. So they don't have a very long lifetime as opposed to the cholesterol drugs, which people have to take every day for a long time, and you don't really develop resistance to those drugs. So, we've, so the federal, uh, the, the government is trying to stimulate more research in this area and support uh, giving people longer patent lives, for example, and helping them get to uh, early testing sooner to help stimulate that. And the other point I'd put out here is the vaccines is another key piece of the, of the strategy, because as we develop new vaccines for the resistant strains of bacteria that are out there, that can have a dramatic effect on the resistance rates. And, and to, to jump the, to cut to the chase with streptococcus pneumoniae, that's what saved us. That in 2004, we, Prevnar, which was one of the newer conjugate pneumococcal vaccines that came out, uh, had high efficacy against the resistant strains that were circulating, and we saw a pretty nice decline as soon as uh, those vaccin uh, that vaccine got released. And the last piece here is to improve international collaboration and capacities. Again, these bugs don't know any borders, and they, and they go from, you know, one air airline trip will bring bugs from one country to another, and so we need to be aware of what's circulating and, uh, in different countries and think about how those uh, bugs get transmitted. Um, so common adverse, so I'm talking about resistance, which most of us hopefully will never have to experience, and it's not a very common harm to an individual. But, uh, so I do want to talk about what are the more common adverse effects of antibiotics, because there are trade-offs when you use antibiotics. Uh, and of course, the first is allergic reactions. So skin infections are the most common, but you can get very serious autoimmune type reactions to antibiotics called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, which are fatal. Um, Another one is nausea, cramps, and diarrhea. This affects about 30% of patients in general when they take an antibiotic. It often leads to them not completing the course of antibiotics, which is another thing that can help stimulate resistant strains. Um, so this is a, a common uh, side effect that we worry about. Yeast infections in women, again, another third uh, of patients of women who take antibiotics will develop a yeast infection, which then needs another treatment, uh, oftentimes of an antifungal. And then costs. Um, so many patients, as you'll see, go to the doctor to, uh, because they think they need antibiotics. So they pay a copay to see the doctor. Then they'll pay another copay for the antibiotic. And this is what, you know, over thousands and millions of people raises the cost of health care in this country. Now, there's less common adverse effects that we should know about with antibiotics because when, anytime we come out with new drugs, we do clinical trials with hundreds and thousands of patients, and we believe that they're safe when they come out, but we can't guarantee against rare side effects. And so you've seen this in the news with other types of drugs. And so with big data analyses, with big health systems now, and, and the big computers that we have, we can actually look to, for rare side effects. And a couple of these have shown up with the fluoroquinolones, which are a very powerful second-line antibiotic that uh, are fairly, you know, many people have been, uh, end up getting exposed to for certain types of infections. Tendon rupture is the, the first one that we recognize, a threefold increased risk uh, in people who take fluoroquinolones. And then the retinal detachment, which just sounds devastating um, uh, as a cause of blindness, uh, they were seeing uh, an increased risk of uh, four 
per 10,000 person years. Uh, so again, rare, four out of every 10,000 persons who get antibiotics per year, uh, but it's not zero. And this type of data, again, is, is information we should share with patients as they make their decisions. Azithromycin, one of the more common antibiotics, and probably the number one antibiotic for a long time, um, called ZPAC also. Uh, more recently, an analysis showed that it was associated with increased rates of, of, of death from cardiovascular disease. And what, what you see here is that in patients who had average or low risk of heart disease, there was really no effect of the antibiotics on, on cardiovascular mortality. So this is the majority of patients taking the antibiotics. This is, these are the patients that enroll in the clinical trials. So we'd never thought that there would be anything, any problem with them. But once they started looking in, among patients who are at the highest risk of heart disease with severe heart disease, we were seeing a much bigger effect of azithromycin on sudden cardiac death and, and, and um, cardiac events. Uh, and so now I'm pretty sure there's, a, there's a, not a black box warning, but a, a strong warning about using macrolide, extended spectrum macrolides in patients with heart disease. And so having said that, uh, you know, so what, if we want to reduce our, our overuse of antibiotics, what is the right antibiotic uh, prescription rate? Now, this cartoon came out in the 1990s uh, where the perception was in the New Yorker magazine that most offices were giving out antibiotics like candy. In this case, the, uh, the receptionist said, don't forget to take a handful of our complimentary antibiotics on your way out. So, uh, you know, again, you know, it wasn't, it's only been about 15 years since, 20 years since we've really now you know, are looking towards reducing overuse of antibiotics. But up until that point, it was really uh, the more antibiotics, the better kind of thing. So this maybe not have been too far-fetched. Um, if you look across the country, this is data from 2013. There's wide variation in antibiotic use across the country. Uh, this is total antibiotic utilization by state. And you can see that these states here uh, in, the, in the south and uh, Mississippi uh, uh, River area have the highest rates of antibiotic utilization per 1,000 patients. This is threefold higher than the West, than California. We're lucky to be out here in the West. Um, when you look at these rates of antibiotic utilization, uh, you know, the, the, the rough estimate is that half of all these antibiotics uh, are probably either unnecessary or inappropriately being used. And you have to ask the question, well, what's driving up the use here? Are people just taking them for no good reason? That's usually not really the case. So what conditions are people overusing antibiotics for in here in the, in the South and in the uh, uh, Mississippi River Valley area? It's, does anyone want to guess? So coughs, colds, respiratory infections. So if you look at the, the, the rate of prescribing in, in these states for the common cold, it's two to three times higher than it is in California. Um, and the important part of this is that if you look at resistance rates, uh, this is resistance to strep pneumonia. You can see that the Pacific region has the lowest rates of resistance uh, to um, antibiotics compared with the Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic. So there's a direct correlation. You know, they're paying a price for overusing antibiotics. And even though we're not down to zero, we're, this is pretty good um, considering where we could have been if we hadn't gotten this under control. And so where do we focus our efforts? Uh, it's really, again, URIs. When we, when we started in the mid-1990s, 75% of all antibiotics in the community were for these five conditions. And these were estimates that we generated using some national data. Now it's about 44%. So we're, you know, we're making some progress here after some significant you know, national and state level campaigns. Uh, but what this slide tells you is that this is the visit rate. So there's millions of visits for each of these conditions, ear infections, sinusitis, pharyngitis, bronchitis, colds, and URIs. And this is the antibiotic prescription rate. So we give a lot more antibiotics to ear infections and sinusitis, as you might imagine, less so for colds and URIs. But the, the problem is that what really matters is what proportion of these infections have a bacterial cause. And that's where, based upon this estimate, you can then uh, calculate how many antibiotics are being overused or in excess. And so even though ear infections get the most antibiotics, m most of those are probably appropriate. It's really for common colds, URIs, and bronchitis that, uh, that you have the biggest amount of excess use, and that's where we focus our efforts for education. And so why do physicians prescribe antibiotics for colds and coughs if they're not necessary? That's the first question you get is when, when we show some of our research results. 
And in the old days, we would just develop a clinical practice guideline. We'd write it in a book. We'd give it to the doctors and say, this is how you should practice medicine, and nothing would change. And this is something we've learned over and over again in guideline development. Some of the key factors that were driving physician prescribing uh, was the, the misperception that green mucus and phlegm is bacterial and needs antibiotics. And in fact, uh, it, you, it doesn't, uh, it can, it's as, frequently it's, it's viral as much as it is bacterial when people first present with a cough or cold illness. Uh, there's diagnostic uncertainty. There's fear about medical liability and malpractice. They want to cover all the bases. And then the number one reason they usually give us is that the patient or the parent really wants it or insists on it. Um, and so that's partly why whenever you do interventions that focus on physicians, you don't see much of a change in prescribing until we started involving the patients. And so we went to patients saying, you know, to give them education and information about appropriate use, and then you see much bigger uh, improvements with the physicians. And so the patient factors, when we did focus groups and studies, were not, actually not that different than the physician factors. Patients also thought that green needed antibiotics because the doctors are telling them that. <laughs> and, uh, and again, it, it's in certain selected cases, meaning patients with chronic lung disease or patients who've, who've had clear mucus for a while, like sinusitis, and then it turns green, those actually are reasonable indicators of bacterial infection. But the vast majority of times that people come in with the first few days of a cough or cold with green secretions or green cough, that's not bacterial. Uh, or it's, it's equally likely to be viral as it is bacterial. Uh, but again, patients want to cover all bases. A very strong factor with patients is that the last time I took the antibiotic, uh, it worked and I got better. And so the problem is patients, they do their best, they try to get better on their own. By seven days or 10 days, they haven't gotten better. They come to the doctor. The doctor gives them the antibiotic, even though they, it's not indicated. The patient gets better, and so the antibiotic got them better. And so this is the cycle that, that uh, it's really hard, you know, because uh, you know, their prior experience was they finally got better when they got the antibiotic. Um, and then stress is a really, we found there's some really good studies on this showing that both emotional and physical stress reduce your, uh, uh, increase your susceptibility to viral infections, and then those viral infections are more likely to become serious infections or potentially get complicated by bacteria. Um, system factors are also at play here. The most important one here is, that, um, is the visit duration. What we found over time is that as doctors got busier, and you probably noticed this when you go to the doctor over the years, the office visit time, the scheduled visit time is shrinking. It went from 20 to 30 minutes uh, 20 years ago to 15 minutes now. And as the visit time shrinks, it becomes harder to have a conversation with a patient about why they don't need antibiotics. It's easier to give the antibiotic. And so um, what they found is that doctors were using the antibiotic as a way to go to the next patient. When, and it doesn't sound right, but you're in a busy practice seeing 40 patients a day. and um, and unfortunately, that's what happens. And so we've worked with uh, systems now where they uh, protect some of that time for discussion and also give some of that education before the visit so that they can actually have a, a full discussion. I just want to show you a couple slides on, on the reality of what the physician is feeling uh, in the practice because this is data from the urgent care clinic where we surveyed patients and we asked them first, uh, uh, in terms of the reason for your visit, uh, do, uh, do you think you need antibiotics? How often do you do, is that an important reason for your visit? And uh, over 50% of the patients said that uh, thinking they needed antibiotics uh, was a very important reason for the visit. Uh, only 10% said it was not a reason for the visit. And how much do you want antibiotics today? Again, almost 50%, uh, very much uh, so. Uh, somewhat uh, another 25%. Very few patients didn't know or said not at all. Um, and again, I think this is not rocket science. It, it's sort of, it's intuitive because patients try to, try to treat this, these infections on their own before they come to the doctor. Uh, but again, if we can give them more tools and things at home, we, it's possible we can prevent some of these uh, uh, expectations for antibiotics. And sure enough, it's not only one thing to show that patients expect antibiotics, but we show that doctors prescribe antibiotics more frequently to patients who have a strong desire for antibiotics than they do to patients who are low or not sure they have antibiotics, even though they have the exact same illness and clinical features. Um, so uh, what is the evidence-based management of, of URIs? Um, well, this is, you know, there's been a lot of work from the CDC, and there's lots of materials there. I wasn't going to cover all the clinical conditions. Uh, but basically, uh, cold and runny nose, bronchitis and chest colds are viral infections and don't need antibiotics. Uh, 
Uh, whooping cough, however, uh, which is a persistent cough, sometimes uh, with post-cough uh, vomiting and, and other severe features, um, does need antibiotics to prevent spread. Flu is a viral infection and doesn't need antibiotics. Strep throat needs antibiotics, but it's only present in about 10% of sore throats. Uh, in adults and about 30% in kids. And so this is where testing is important or at least using clinical criteria. Fluid in the middle ear, uh, which is a common cause of, of ear pain, um, doesn't respond to antibiotics. Urinary tract infections do. And so what can you do to reduce your risk um, of resistant infections? Uh, well, first, what we've been talking about today is limiting uh, antibiotic use to conditions that definitely need them. Um, another key principle, however, is practicing good hygiene because of the way these bugs are spread. And so minimizing hand-mouth eye contact because most of these bugs are spread through that mechanism, not through the air. Uh, washing your hands regularly, really very important. I, I work in urgent care, so I've gotten used to washing my hands before I see the patient, after I see the patient, if five minutes have gone by. Uh, it's the only way to keep yourself from getting sick. Reduce stress. Uh, we've seen that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, patients who are sleep deprived because, well, in fact, we've done studies with medical students to show that just before finals, the rates of, uh, of, of respiratory infections goes up and the rates of antibiotic use go up as a result of that. Um, so stress is an important factor here. And then sleep, eating right, and exercise are ways to prevent getting sick with these infections. And so I want to finish on a positive note. As I mentioned, in 1995, we had sort of the call to, to action from uh, the resistance that had developed in strep pneumonia. And, um, and there had been a lot of efforts put into place through the public health departments, through the state and local health departments, as well as through research institutions. Um, and so this shows you a graph of antibiotic utilization rates across uh, this time period for all visits and then stratified by respiratory uh, acute respiratory tract infections versus all other visits. And so this is just the visit rates, which don't seem like they're changing too much um, between uh, kids who are less than five and adults uh, who are, well, children and adults over five. But when you look at antibiotic prescription rates, you see that here for acute respiratory tract infections, we've seen about a 30% decline in antibiotic use for kids under five. And they're a big consumer of antibiotics. And so that, I think, is, is, is really remarkable. We haven't seen much of a change in the antibiotic use for adults, unfortunately. And so that's where we need more work to do. We didn't see any change in antibiotic use for non-respiratory tract infections. Uh, but again, they're a much smaller piece of the pie, as you can see from, from the rates. And so I tried really hard to get this slide to work, but it didn't happen. Uh, so I extended this out to 2008. And so what you see is the actual the resistance rates going down, which is why this bug is now at the bottom of that serious threat list, even though it's still a serious threat. But we've, we've been able to keep this under control. It's these other bugs now that we're really worried about. Uh, but again, continuing to, to um, re-energize our efforts around appropriate antibiotic use and, and, and teaching both uh, the healthcare providers as well as the public about when antibiotics are most appropriate is the only way we're really going to get a handle on this. And so with that, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it over to Deborah. Can I take a? Yes? Oh, I do? Oh, wow. OK. So we have some questions, yeah. Yeah, I, so the question is, what's the prospect that we can eliminate antibiotic use among animals, in animals? Now, I've been in those meetings because I was on the first few task forces, and hearing the food industry and the agricultural industry talk about why they use antibiotics, um, it's a really, it, it's, it's not as straightforward as you think um, because we want a safe food supply as well. Um, but, uh, if we look to other countries, especially the Netherlands and Denmark, I think Denmark in specific, they outlawed all antibiotics in the food and animal um, uh, sectors. And the question was, was the price of their chicken going to go up? Was the price of their beef going to go up? Were there going to be new infections and things? And they didn't see any of that. In fact, um, the, the, things, the cost of things went down because they weren't having to pay for all the antibiotics in the animals. And so I think that the prospects are good, but I think that some of the politics, unfortunately, and, um, and some of the, the um, courage, I, I think, to take that next step is what we need. I think we've had a really, uh, uh, just one more point, I think we've had a nice uh, uh, um, benefit of some producers now advertising antibiotic-free, hormone-free uh, food and, and products and things, and I think uh, 
uh, the, the strong market purchasing those things has stimulated some of the other uh, manufacturers to at least consider that there is a market for uh, not using antibiotics in those products. Yeah. So the question is, do they, use fa do they have factory farming in Denmark? I think it's a lot less common there than it is here. So I, I do think that's a factor. And I know that uh, what happens here with factory farming is that when one animal gets sick, they treat the whole lot. And that's a lot of antibiotic exposure to animals who didn't need it. But it's easier for them to just to stick it in the feed than it is for them to isolate or do things to prevent one animal from, from getting the other animal sick. And so that's always a challenge. Oh, in the red. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about those because that, that you know, that's the other side of the clinical side that I work on. So with recurring sinus infections, there is some evidence to show that antibiotics help. Um, but they should, only, they should always be used in conjunction with some other things that are really important. So things that reduce inflammation in the sinuses oftentimes is more important than the antibiotics. So nasal steroids, corticosteroids are what we use for that. And then decongestants to help to get things to drain is really important. So the key with sinusitis is not to use antibiotics within the first seven days of a sinus symptoms because most colds affect the sinuses and most of those get better on their own. But if you've had symptoms 10 or more days and you have pain, redness, uh, and then purulent green discharge, those are then the indications you have about a 60% chance of having a, a bacteria and that's who we're trying to, re to, uh, to restrict the antibiotic use to. Does that make sense, answer your question? Over here. There are a number of things out there because there's a couple principles with infections that are worth knowing. The first is that uh, what we learned, the way you learn in a medical school is stasis equals infection. So things, fluids, and secretions that don't move or can't drain get infected. And, um, and so a sinus infection develops because the mucus in the sinus cavity can't drain. If we put a needle in there and drained it, your infection would be gone. Same with ear infections. So ear infections develop because the eustachian tube blocks closes off and the fluid builds up and the bacteria have nowhere to go, so they multiply and cause an infection. In the old days before antibiotics, they had these long needles. They'd just stick them in there and drain the fluid and you'd be done. Um, and so abscesses, another good example of, of, you know, if we can just drain the abscess, most of the time they don't need antibiotics. So, so, the, so in terms of non-antibiotic options, the first is if it's, if it's something like that, where we can just drain it, or if it's a UTI where we want to increase our fluid intake and flush it out, those are all good things. And then there are, you know, there's a few, I don't want to, I don't want to mention too many names of these uh, herbals because the evidence is still shaky on whether they really work, but the point is that these are anti-inflammatories. There's one called Pelargonium pseudoides that comes from a geranium, a South African geranium species that they used before antibiotics had developed for tuberculosis. And then they stopped using it once we got antibiotics, and so they came back to it. And a lot of people use it in Europe as a non-antibiotic treatment for the inflammation of a viral infection. So I do think there are things out there. Um, and so good principles of drainage and, and then some of these anti-inflammatories can help. I'm gonna go here and then there and then there. Yeah, that's a great question. So what about the prophylactic use of antibiotics, especially after dental procedures? That, that, um, that science and, and recommendation has been evolving very recently. And I'd say 10, eight years ago, uh, most anyone with any heart disease condition would get antibiotics before going to the, to the dentist for a procedure. And if the dentist didn't know if somebody actually had a good exam and had a good heart history, they'd just give them the antibiotics to be safe. Now we're trying to be more careful with antibiotics. And so the, the, the antibiotics before dental procedures is now re only recommended for patients with very severe types of cardiac uh, repairs and malformations. The vast majority of patients don't really need them before a procedure. Um, and so it, it is indicated in some cases, but in, in, as a general rule, you don't really need them. Back here. So advice for antibiotics, for doctors who give antibiotics without a culture. That's also seen as a little bit of a sea change uh, because in the old days we would culture everything and what we were finding was that we were treating a lot of people with positive cultures but they didn't have infection, they just had colonization. And so um, where we've gone now, it, it, depending on the infection, you definitely want the culture before you start antibiotics because then you can't culture again. So any severe infection that's inside the abdomen, for example, or you know, meningitis, you probably wanna get a culture before you give antibiotics.
But pneumonia, for example, where the phlegm has all kinds of contaminated bacteria, you can't really tell what's causing the, the infection versus what's a colonized bug. So we don't do cultures for pneumonia at all. And bronchitis isn't a bacterial infection anyway, so it's really a viral infection. So doing cultures for, uh, for bronchitis, you're going to find 20% turn up positive for bacteria that are just colonizing you, but in fact, you know, it's not causing the infection. Uh, UTI is the one area where things have changed, where in, uh, we used to do urine cultures for most women with UTIs, and what we've learned now is that uh, in, in, for uncomplicated UTIs, we shouldn't do any urine testing or urine cultures because women with the, who have positive symptoms and don't have complicating features, 80% of the time have a true infection, and so we should just treat them empirically, and only if they recur, if they don't get better within three days, do we then go down and do more testing. So we're moving away from testing in some of this area. Back here. That's a great question. So the question is whether echinacea is a viable uh, substitute or alternative to antibiotics. And I think that we've been going through a weird cycle with echinacea. The problem was a lot of the, there's a lot of popularity in use because people were seeing some benefits. When they did proper clinical trials, they didn't see any benefit. But then they said, well, why don't I test and the, the product they tested the product, and there was no active ingredient in the product. We went around Denver trying to do our own study uh, when I was there. Uh, nine out of nine samples from different stores had no active ingredient in the stuff you were buying in the store. So first, the most important thing first is you need to find the real stuff. So if you find echinacea, it's the echinacea purpura. And if you can find a reliable vendor, I think there is some new evidence showing that it's, it's it, it can help with some of the symptoms. It's not a cure, but people are feeling better with it, and we'll probably have another real clinical trial coming up soon. In the pink? Yeah, so the question is, what's the mechanism by which antibiotics are useful growth prom promoters? I don't think we know completely. On one level, we think that it helps uh, kill off certain bacteria, like the healthy bacteria, that uh, maintain metabolism in a certain way, and that what gets replaced are, are bacteria that reduce your metabolism and the animal gets bigger. It may not be healthier, but it gets bigger. They also know that there is some association between antibiotics and cancer, and so there may be some specific growth-promoting properties uh, of antibiotics that are doing it that way, but I don't think we really know. One more question? or last question in the back, and then I'll be available afterwards. So the question is, which probiotics uh, and which systems are most important? I believe what we know the most well is the GI, the intestinal system, and the, and the lactobacillus is really uh, the key one there. Um, we haven't really, I'm not familiar with any literature about reconstituting bacteria in the oral na nasal pharynx, but I think it kind of flows up and down, and, um, but I can't tell you much more than that, unfortunately.